Welcome back, explorers. Today, we're going to be exploring this river ecosystem, seeing the organisms and food webs that we can find here. Now, in part one of the river ecosystem video, we talked about river hydrology, but today is all about the animals and plants that we can find in these places. Let's get exploring and see if we can find some river producers. Unlike terrestrial ecosystems, such as forests or grasslands, life on the river isn't quite so dependent on the soil. Rather than being built from the ground up, you could say that a river ecosystem is built from the outside in. As mentioned in the last video, river sediments come from the terrestrial ecosystems in the river's watershed, and there is often quickly flowing water in the channel. These two factors combine to make the life of a river-dwelling plant pretty unstable, so any producers that survive here need to be able to adapt well to rapidly changing environmental conditions. In some places, conditions within the channel are too unstable for any plants to grow, so all plant life exists here on the riverbank. Now you can see that these grasses have really long roots. These are in the water, but most of their root system is in the bank. Now these roots help to hold the soil in place, making sure that there's no runaway erosion, which can result in cloudy and unhealthy water. Just like in terrestrial ecosystems, these plants also provide shelter and food for a wide variety of animals. Now if we take a scoop of water out of the middle of the channel right here, it's not very likely we're going to catch anything. That's because there's no plants here to provide structure or food for animals. But if we move over to the side where we have some plant life and poke around enough with our net, we might just catch ourselves some river consumers. So this is a really good spot. It's a little deeper and a little slower. And we've got some really nice root systems that I'm just sliding the net up underneath and letting the water flow into it. And, ah, oh, it looks like we did finally catch something. So, whoa, look at that. We got a lot, actually. Look at all of these little invertebrates. Now, these are the base of the consumer food chain here in the river. So invertebrates like these, and honestly, I'm not even sure what these are. I'm thinking maybe caddisflies or mayflies. But these and other invertebrates like them live up along the banks like this. They're eating that plant material in little planktons and, and smaller invertebrates. So just like in terrestrial ecosystems, how the insects lived in the, in the rotting logs and ate those logs, that's exactly what they're doing here, but they're living in the root systems of the plants and eating the algae and very small invertebrates that grow there. So in aquatic ecosystems, aquatic invertebrates like these insects make up the base of the consumer food chain. Without little creepy crawlies like this that most people don't even see in these river ecosystems, there wouldn't be food for higher level consumers. So let's go see if we can find some of those. Oh, I got one, I got one. I got a little fish. Oh, beautiful. All right, let me get that creature container, Bryce. So this guy's, based on its body shape and markings, I'm thinking is some kind of little mosquito fish. Now these are very cool because that's actually about as big as they'll ever get. Mosquito fish stay very small, and as their name suggests, they do in fact prey on invertebrates. So this fish was caught right over there in the root system where we just got those bugs, and I'm almost certain that he has been munching on them. And these are pretty much the, the very first secondary consumers in this creek ecosystem. So these could eat plants, and they could also definitely eat the invertebrates, like the ones we just caught. So this is like the, the teeniest little secondary consumer you can find. Now fish are among the most diverse groups of animals found on the planet. There's hundreds of different species throughout North Carolina, some as small as this, some as large as like a largemouth bass. And each of those different species has a very different ecological niche, but this is a perfect example of one of the smallest secondary consumers that we can find here. And he's such a cute little animal. So we'll get him back in the creek, but I'm really glad I could show him to you guys. All right, check it out, guys. Look at this. This is the northern water snake. Now, northern water snakes are a very common species across many creek ecosystems throughout North Carolina. This is a completely non-venomous snake that's very important to the ecosystem because it makes up that middle layer. So a snake of this size is going to be preying on things like minnows, tadpoles, smaller snakes. They're opportunistic feeders, so that means they eat basically anything that they can get inside their mouths. 
Now he still has a lot of growing to do, and he can be two or three times the size when he's an adult. But at this size, even though he is a predator of lots of smaller organisms, he would also be a tasty snack for something like a great blue heron, or even a big largemouth bass, or something like that. So snakes can actually transfer energy between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, which is something else that's pretty unique about them. So it's very important that we educate people about the job that snakes have in creek ecosystems. And we'll put this little guy right back in the water, and you can see very, very calm. He's just here doing his ecosystem job like any other animal. Depending on the size and location of the river ecosystem, there can be many different secondary and tertiary consumers with overlapping niches. Usually, there are at least one or two species of true tertiary consumer in these systems. Top dogs, such as osprey, or even huge reptiles, such as American alligators. As these animals progress through their life cycles, they often work their way up the food chain, starting as secondary consumers and ending up as apex predators. Just like in terrestrial ecosystems, these tertiary consumers are critically important to maintaining the energy levels of all their prey items, making sure that no population grows too large and consumes too much of the resources. We call the interactions between all the different organisms in an ecosystem a food web. A food web is like a map that shows how energy moves throughout the system. By following the arrows, we can see the direction of energy flow. Since ecosystems like rivers often have consumers with overlapping niches, these diagrams are useful in helping us visualize where each organism fits in, and how it may be interacting with other ecological components. Yeah. With all the incredible animals that live in rivers, they're an extremely important ecosystem, providing lots of proteins and healthy fats to people like you and me, through resources like fish. Also, rivers deliver fresh water to terrestrial ecosystems, making sure that plants and animals have plenty to survive and thrive. Also, when rivers slow down and spread out, they can create a very unique and very important aquatic ecosystem, the wetland. Now we're going to be learning all about wetlands in our next episode, but until then, stay curious and keep adventuring everywhere. This has been Zeno of The Wild Report, signing out.